World War II, the Royal Air Force was outnumbered in terrifying, deadly combat, which would soon develop into the first truly worldwide conflict. To support this effort in Britain's hour of need meant recruits, and lots of them highly trained in aviation and aeronautical engineering. This is the story of the Air Cadets. One visionary, Air Commodore John Shamier, a World War I reconnaissance pilot, had seen firsthand young, inexperienced airmen with just a few hours of training being prematurely sent into brutal aerial combat, only to fall easy prey to the better trained enemy aviators. By the late 1930s, Air Commodore Shamier was the leading light of the Air League, an organisation that could see a bright future for aviation and wanted to make the British public aware of its potential. To meet the need for aircrew and engineers, the Air League formed the Air Defence Cadet Corps, aiming to attract and train some 20,000 young men with an interest in aviation. They would parade at 200 squadrons, mainly based in schools which would be run by local people. Each unit was backed by leading citizens who would also raise the funds needed for the activities. At each squadron, the primary aim was to give the cadets an interest and awareness of aviation. They tried to give as much service and aviation background as possible, as well as giving instruction in drill, discipline, wearing the uniform correctly and how to behave on RAF stations. From the start, the Royal Air Force helped the squadrons with funding by matching the Air League's contribution of five shillings, around 25 pence in today's money, per cadet per year. They also created close ties with local flying stations to get the cadets airborne and to help with technical training. The aviation industry and local flying clubs also saw the huge value of the Corps and helped the eager cadets to take to the air. The Air Defence Cadet Corps captured the mood of the British people and in their eagerness to help the nation, young men rushed to join the ADCC in their thousands. In this rush to become the first squadron, Leicester achieved the distinction of being the first to register number 1F Leicester squadrons. Within six months, 42 squadrons had been registered and by the beginning of the next year, the 50th was registered. Number 50F Lambeth Squadron. To this day, the first 50 squadrons formed have the letter F in their title to denote they are founder squadrons. By the end of the year, the number of units had grown to almost 200, with requests from many other towns and cities to have one in their own town or school. Of course, girls didn't want to be left out, so the Women's Junior Air Corps was formed by the government along with similar organisations for girls with an interest in the Army and Navy. Following the successful Dunkirk evacuation and the Battle of Britain, thoughts changed to how World War II could be won. Although the Air Defence Cadet Corps had made an amazing start, it was simply not equipped to meet the increasing demands of the rapidly expanding Royal Air Force. What was needed was a nationally funded organisation. So, on the 5th of February 1941, the Air Training Corps was officially established by Royal Warrant with His Majesty King George VI as its first Air Commodore in Chief. The new organisation was to be built around three pillars to support the cadets. Staff, civilian committees and padres. Its officers were to hold commissions in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve Training Branch, supported by warrant officers and civilian instructors. As well as taking over the mantle of the Air Defence Cadet Corps, the Air Training Corps was also to absorb the school-based Officer Training Corps Air Sections, known simply as the OTC. The new corps was launched in a blaze of publicity, including a broadcast to the nation as a postscript to the BBC's 9 o'clock home news. Soon, towns and cities across the country were clamouring to form their own squadrons. And uh, do your parents agree to your joining the ATC? Yes, sir. Mama says he's only too glad to get me out of the way of an evening. And we appeal to you and to similar groups throughout the country to foster ATC squadrons. We need you, ex-service men, to train these cadets in the traditions of the fighting forces. You, schoolmasters and engineers, give them the necessary basic training. Doctors, dentists and physical training experts to care for their health. With your help, every boy of spirit and of the necessary standard of fitness can receive his preliminary training for the Royal Air Force, whatever his walk of life. Newspaper boys, errand boys, boys working in factories, serving in shops, 
in garages and a hundred other places. And those boys in dead-end occupations with nowhere to go but the street corner. We want also, of course, those boys who've had better chances of preparing themselves in our county and technical schools. And those who have enjoyed the benefits of education in our great public schools. In fact, we want the pick of the whole youth of the country. The rush was so great that some 400 squadrons were formed in the first 18 days of existence of the Air Training Corps. I hereby solemnly promise on my honour to serve this unit loyally and to be faithful to my obligations as a member of the Air Training Corps. Within a year, the Air Training Corps had over 170,000 cadets, 15,000 staff and 1,500 squadrons. At its peak, there were almost a quarter of a million cadets. A badge was designed for the ATC featuring a Falcon, an ideal choice because it has many of the qualities a good cadet should also have. Remarkable vision, enormous strength and incredible courage. Influenced by mounting shortages of aircrew and the need for expansion in all trades, many older cadets joined the Royal Air Force and the Fleet Air Arm. Younger cadets were also keen to support the war effort, working in their free time on RAF stations to carry messages, to provide extra muscle in aircraft handling, filling sandbags and loading miles of ammunition belts. They also actively supported the police and civilian emergency services. Some cadets volunteered to help the Air Transport Auxiliary. Squadrons adapted their training programmes to prepare the cadets for specific air and ground trades, and also concentrated on physical fitness. In some areas, training was available many evenings and included a variety of aircrew and ground crew subjects using redundant airframes. Physical training and a wide range of technical skills that were also proved essential when the cadets joined the Royal Air Force. This training was made available against a background of limited school curriculum, which saw many youngsters leave formal education at 14 years old. The RAF was right behind the new corps, providing the first summer camp at RAF Holton, week-long training courses for its officers at RAF Cosford, before setting up a special air experience flight of 10 aircraft, Oxfords and Dominies, for the sole purpose of giving cadets air experience flights although cadets also managed to fly from time to time in other service aircraft. Soon, the fledgling organisation reached a milestone. The Air Training Corps has just passed its first birthday. It is growing into a healthy child of 1,400 squadrons, with a strength considerably larger than that of the pre-war Royal Air Force. I ask you to give your help in whatever way you can to aid our young men to reach their heart's desire, and so to victory. As after more than 12 months of training, the ATC celebrates a year of splendid work. These are the young brothers of the RAF who will soon achieve their ambition and swell the ranks of the men with wings. By now, the fortune of the Allies was changing. Although Bomber Command had lost 55,000 aircrew in action, with 8,000 injured and a further 10,000 in captivity as prisoners of war, air supremacy had been achieved without losing as many as aircrew as originally predicted. As a consequence, reductions on intake had to be made and large number of air cadets waiting to join the service were disappointed. In recognition of the huge numbers of ex-cadets who had served during the war, including 25,000 who had flown with the Royal Air Force and Fleet Air Arm, the Chief of the Air Staff said, In maintaining the flow of men to the RAF, the ATC has made a decisive contribution to our victory. What was going to happen to the ATC now that the need for aircrew had been reduced? Would the government still support the Corps during peacetime? Fortunately, fears as to its future were unfounded, as it was announced that it would be retained reporting directly to Home Command. This signalled a change in the very reason air cadets existed. There was a move of emphasis away from pre-entry training with a minimum joining age of 16 years to become instead a uniformed youth organisation, with cadets now permitted to join at 14. In this new future, the approach to training would need to change and adapt. 
building on its aviation roots while also providing training useful for civilian life, developing good leaders and citizens whilst encouraging sports and outdoor adventure. A new Royal Warrant was issued and the Air Training Corps settled down to a post-war strength of 30,000 cadets. This new warrant coincided with the start of post-war national service needed to support the Cold War. In another major change, the original Officer Training Corps Air Sections, together with those Air Training Corps squadrons who were school-based, became Royal Air Force Sections in the newly formed Combined Cadet Forces, although they kept their close links with the Air Training Corps. The first international camp was a three-week visit to Canada for 46 cadets. This was the first of many visits, which have become known as the International Air Cadet Exchange, today made to 21 countries right across the globe. Gliding had been available throughout the war using 500 single-seat Kirby Cadet gliders, flown from 84 elementary gliding squadrons using a winch to get airborne. The gliding fleet was now upgraded to two-seater canvas gliders, the Kirby Cadet Mark III and the Sedberg. This revolutionised training as the instructor could now fly with the cadet. The Air Cadet Gliding Organisation was by now the largest in the Western world. The Sedberg, although being a large glider, was a high performer, setting several records including one flight with a height gain of 15,240 feet. That's almost three miles. As well as gliding, many cadets also managed to fly in frontline Royal Air Force aircraft. On the death of King George VI, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh became the Air Commodore in Chief and before long squadrons were helping to pioneer the Duke of Edinburgh's award. The RAF sections of the Combined Cadet Force also had their own fleet of single-seater primary gliders, appropriately called grasshoppers. They were based at the schools and in the initial stages of training would be balanced on a two-meter tripod so that the cadets could experience the effects of the controls. Later, once the cadet had a feel for the controls, the glider would be taken off the tripod and launched using a rubber bungee for a dozen or so ground slides before progressing to low, then high hops. After the cadet had mastered this, they would gradually build up to low-level flights of around 30 metres. An opportunity for all cadets was the Flying Scholarship Scheme, where cadets could undertake 30 hours of flying instruction to qualify them for a private pilot's licence. Initially, there were some 250 scholarships which were sponsored by the Royal Air Force, which was shortly joined by several hundred more courtesy of the Air League. Flying scholarships have remained popular to this day. Soon, the Air Experience flight started to operate the standard Royal Air Force trainer of the time, the de Havilland Chipmunk, a two-seated trainer that continued in service for four decades. And at the height of the Cold War, cadets joined in their thousands to secure national service in the Royal Air Force. And changes were on their way for both the still male-only Air Cadets and the Women's Junior Air Corps. The Women's Junior Air Corps was replaced by the Girls' Venture Corps, which had two wings, one mirroring the Army Cadets and the other the Air Cadets, who concentrated on air activities. As a result of the review, the training on offer to cadets was further enhanced, and it was announced that wings were to be grouped together into regions in the near future, and that closer links would be fostered with local communities and civilian organisations. Other introductions included adventure training and more of an emphasis on citizenship. Annual camps were as popular as ever, even more so if they involved visiting an RAF station with the latest aviation hardware, where in addition to activities such as visiting air traffic control and the fire section, you might also get your hands on a Mark II fighter aircraft. Training continued to develop quickly and included engineering skills which included radio and radar, 
first aid, air navigation, air remodeling, and Morse code. This classroom training was augmented with projects and adventure training activities. In the air, a new glider, the Venture Mark II, could take off and land like a light aeroplane, and at height, the propeller would be stopped and the glider would soar like a normal winch launch glider. The Venture was used on nine volunteer gliding schools, while the Kirby Cadet and the Sedberg soldiered on. Despite its age, the Chipmunk was still soldiering on in all of the 13 Air Experience flights. The Chipmunk was also selected for a new course teaching air navigation. By now, the Kirby Cadet and Sedberg gliders have been in service for three decades, and they were replaced by modern, glass-reinforced plastic gliders, including the Viking. The other canvas-clad glider, the Venture, was eventually replaced by the Vigilant. Girls were allowed to join the Air Cadets for the first time, and were soon taking part in all of the activities on offer with relish. Until then, girls who were interested in the aviation had only previously been able to join the Girls' Venture Corps, or belong to the Combined Cadet Force. Five overseas squadrons were formed in Germany and Cyprus to allow teenagers whose parents were serving in the armed services in Europe to join the Air Training Corps. The squadrons were a huge success. By now, the Air Training Corps had been in existence for almost five decades and thoughts turned towards celebrating this history. A large exhibition space was set aside at Southampton's Solent Sky Museum for a major exhibition. The presentation of the Challenge Cup kick-started the national celebrations to mark 50 years of the Air Training Corps. By now, the venerable Chipmunk had been in service with the Royal Air Force for over four decades and was replaced by the Bulldog two-seat side-by-side training aircraft which gave a far better view for the cadet. Before long, the Bulldog was reaching the end of its service life and was replaced by the Grob Tutor. To help potential employers understand the true value of air cadet training, many areas were accredited by BTEC starting with qualification in aviation studies before also encompassing public services and music, which the cadets can gain through normal activities. And the opportunities to gain airborne skills continued to grow with courses for microlight and hang glider flying, together with a sports parachuting course. A new decade saw increased involvement with local communities and a wider role in national celebrations. Air Cadets came together to celebrate Her Majesty the Queen's Golden Jubilee, including an event in Berkshire which saw the Air Commodore in Chief visiting a high profile Air Cadet display. New ideas such as PC based flight simulators needed funding support, so squadrons took the matter into their own hands by raising hundreds of thousands of pounds for improved training facilities as well as providing much needed cash for service charities. Aerospace came to the fore with regional activity centres springing up nationwide where cadets can experience and learn from a myriad of facilities, flight simulators, wind tunnels and air traffic simulators. Also in the same vein, a fleet of air cadet engagement platforms hit the road, hoping to